the, I think we mentioned this last week, but I think uh, I think we had several people out of town last week and different things. So uh, these are the class books for um, Daniel class. And I say class books, we're not going to like go through them, but it at least gives you a synthesis of what's going on in the chapter and some illustrations, especially when we get to the second half of the book, the illustrations. I'm a visual guy. I have to see what's going on. And uh, so the illustrations can become helpful uh, in that way. And so um, these are here. Uh, I assume we're consolidated to one box, but take what you need. We will order more. That's not a problem. Um, and we'll start that probably whew, in a couple of weeks, or I might change my mind and gain my sanity and do something else. But anyway, um, the first six chapters will be fun. The second six, that's when you're going to see me cross-eyed a lot. Um, so let's look at, uh, we're in Second Kings 25. And we are moving to Daniel from 2 Kings because Daniel kind of picks up the narrative of First and 2 Kings. And um, so we made it through chapter 25 and verse 21 last time. So I want to do something a little bit different tonight in this sense. Um, so when the architect of the final solution uh, in World War II, which would have been Eichmann, uh, and by final solution, of course, we mean the extermination of Jewish people, uh, when asked about how you, how do you pull off mass murder? Like, are people really going to get behind that? His statement was, they said, they said to him, it's going to be such a tragedy. And he said this, one person's death is a tragedy. Six million is just a statistic. What does he mean by that? One person, we can, we can get in their skin. We can kind of live there. We can see what happens to them. Six million people is, like, that's hard for me to, to imagine. I mean, I know there's more than 6 million people, but I've never seen 6 million people. I mean, we're talking about combining southern states together to get 6 million people. It's a lot of people. And so sometimes it's harder for us to process large-scale tragedy than it is individual tragedy. Now, he was using that to manipulate and to commit untold evil. What I want us to do tonight is kind of get in the skin of the Israelites. So you talk about the Holocaust, and we talk about it in generalities. It's another person, it's another thing to get a book and to read one person's experience of the Holocaust, right? When we're in school, the diary of Anne Frank, or um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was a child at uh, Auschwitz. He's now a world judge. Um, to get into his story and to, to read it, has a way of humanizing what is something that is so difficult to understand. And so what I want us to do is, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're looking at the rise and ruin of Israel, and it's so easy to look at it and go, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the temple's gone, all the stuff is gone, you know, it, whatever. And, you know, at this point, we've, we've been doing this a while. It's kind of like, when is this going to be over? But we're missing the point that this has a forever changing and deep impact on the Jewish nation as a whole. Like, forever changing. Their, their thoughts about Messiah are completely revolutionized and in many ways um, brought down to reality. They, they, they begin to realize that, or they, they struggle with, did God really keep his word? And we're going to look at a psalm or two that kind of deals with that. 
And I want us to kind of just get in their skin a little bit tonight and see the world through their eyes and, and how all these promises and how it looks like these promises are broken and how they're trying to put all this back together and reason through it. So <clears throat> I want us, first of all, to look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89. So Psalm 89 is talking about um, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 17, which we have studied that before in the past in sermons and other places. But that's the place where God promised to David that he would always have a descendant sitting upon the throne. That he, his family, you remember as we've gone through these kings, in the north you saw dynasty changes all the time. A different ruling family kills this ruling family that kills this ruling family. It's a different family. The south has stayed the same. Everybody's been a descendant from David. And part of that has to do with the promise that God made to David that he would always have a son sitting on the throne. Well, what we just read about at the end of 2 Kings, when we were in 2 Kings 25 is... Zedekiah is the last guy, and he's gone. There's not a king on the throne anymore. So now you're, you're a Jew in this time, and you know about the promise that God made to David. It's been woven into the fabric of your community for a couple hundred years. And now there is no king on the throne. So you ask yourself, what? Did we misunderstand the promise? Did God break his promise? Okay, that's what this psalm is about. Um, For an example, let's just begin in verse 19. It says, of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to the one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hands should be established with him. My arm also will strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love will be with him, and my name and my horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, uh, you are my father and my God and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep with him forever. My covenant will stand firm with him. I will establish his offspring forever. His throne is the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and don't keep my commandments, I'll punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes, but I will not remove my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. He, uh, his offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun his throne as long as the sun is before me. Like the moon, it shall be established. A faithful witness in the skies. Over and over, you see them see the writer saying the same thing. I'm not taking my steadfast love from him. I'm not taking my steadfast love from him. I'm not taking it from him. I'm not taking it from him. Verse 38. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust, and you have breached all the walls. You have laid the strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him, and has, he has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all of his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back uh, the edge of his, of his sword, and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You cut short the days of his youth, and you covered him with shame. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is, for what vanity you have created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol, or uh, just a Hebrew way of describing of death? Now David, in this context, not only stands for David himself, but that entire line. 
You have promised you're going to stay faithful to us. You're going to stay faithful to us. You're going to stay faithful to us. But now. You took it away. Now, this is what makes this so peculiar. So in these, the Psalms, you have a number of different characterizations of Psalms categories that we sometimes put them into. That can be helpful sometimes. It can be not so helpful at others. But this is called a Psalm of Lament. And one of the things about Psalms of Lament is that they start on a low note, but on the whole, they will end on a high note of hope. It's like the person is thinking and reasoning and talking with God and they come to a good place by the end of the psalm. This psalm of lament is actually just the opposite. It actually starts in a really good place, and it ends with nothing but questions. So, we have a group of people that feel this. God made us a promise So where's the throne? So when we read about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the destruction of the throne, it's not just some kind of empty, you know, historical fact that it's gone. There are serious, faithful Jews who went into captivity who are now wondering, does this mean God broke his word? Does this mean God can't be trusted? And that's really what a lot of this psalm is. They're seeking an explanation from God because they, they're just struggling on the inside. How do you reconcile what God has said versus what has happened? And if you've ever been in a situation like that, you know how heavy that is. You're not accusing God of wrong. You're just kind of confused, really. you just caught off guard and it it takes a time to acclimate yourself to what's going on all right fast forward a little bit more to psalm 137 psalm 137 he says by the rivers of babylon this is an exile psalm so it's written talking about captivity. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willow trees, we hung our lyres. These are musical instruments, of course. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. What do you see? What is the predominant feeling of the psalmist as he opens? It starts with a re and ends with a grit. It's regret. They were in God's favor. They were in God's land. They had God's blessing, and they voluntarily forfeited it. You know, sometimes we don't know how blessed we are until the blessing is removed. Right? Think about it on even the smallest scale. A few months back, I was stepping out of the detached garage in our backyard, and I don't know what happened, but my left ankle rolled somehow, and my foot got tucked up underneath it. You know, you don't think about your ankle and your foot a lot until you don't have full mobility. You don't think about your teeth a lot until you've got a toothache. Now, those are small-scale things. What about large-scale things? What they're saying here. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept. And the implication is it was a bitter weeping. We had it made and we forfeited it. We voluntarily forfeited it. 
God sent us prophets. He sent countless people trying to help us. There were pockets of good kings who tried to help us, and we wouldn't listen to them. And now we're here, and the only person we can blame is ourselves. So they feel a sense of regret, but they also feel the sense of betrayal. So in verse 7, he says, Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. So the people of Edom are encouraging Babylon to destroy and to level the city. It's kind of like a cheerleading squad telling, encouraging the Babylonians to, to just wreck them. It's one thing to hurt. It's another thing for other people to take delight in your hurt. You have to be a special kind of sick to delight in somebody's hurt. That's really the only way I know how to put that. You have to be a special kind of sick to delight in people hurting. As a matter of fact, the whole book of Obadiah is about this. He tells Edom that they're going to be punished by the Babylonians because they rejoiced at the downfall of Jerusalem. It's what uh, Solomon says in Proverbs um, 24, maybe. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, lest God see it and direct his anger toward you. Then he says this, <clears throat> O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed will be Blessed is he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be the one who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock or against the stone. What they're talking about is justice. Their children, the Babylonians, killed children in very cruel ways in their invasion of Jerusalem. And what the psalmist is hoping for is justice to be carried out. That the people of Babylon would know what it's like to experience that type of terror. And that type of horror. And so what we're reading about is a traumatic, I mean traumatic event. And then being displaced to your homeland, from your homeland. And knowing you can't ever go back. I mean, little stuff like that you would never think about. Until you can't anymore. All right? Fast forward in the Old Testament a little bit to the book of Lamentations. <clears throat> Lamentations is just that. A lamentation um, of Jeremiah over the city's destruction. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not good. <laughs> if you're looking for a pick-me-up, it's not the place you need to go. It's going to be anything but that. And people will say, you know, it's kind of depressing. Well, of course. When your nation is destroyed and you realize you brought it on by your sinful behavior, there's not really much upside to that. What do you want them to do? Dance in the street? So I want to do something very simple, and that is just to read and listen to what they're saying. Listen to how something we can read in 2 Kings 25, and we can read it so quickly that we just like, yeah, mm -hmm, gone, 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 done. If it were an individual, sometimes when we study individual Bible characters, we're tempted to slow down and think about their life. But when it's the whole nation of Israel, a large group, well, you know, it is what it is, just a historical fact. It's a whole lot more than a historical fact. So, <clears throat> here it's Jeremiah, and the book of Lamentations is a beautiful work of poetry. It is an alpha alphabetical or acrostic. Don't quote me on that. It's alphabetical or acrostic. What it means, it's keyed to the Hebrew alphabet. You'll notice that most of the chapters are 22 verses from the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The third chapter is the exception, but it's 66 verses, and you have three verses paired to each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is a, a tremendous piece of art <clears throat> on its own outside of just being, of being the Word of God. So this is what he says. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become 
She, has, <clears throat> she who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the province, has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. All her lover, among all her lovers, she has found none to comfort her. All her friends dealt treacherously with her and have become her enemies. The people she thought, Jerusalem thought all of these alliances with Egypt and Assyria were going to prove to be, oh, they'll come to our aid, they'll help us. And at the end of the day, they hung them out to dry. Same thing with the prodigal son. Same thing. If you engage in sinful behavior with sinful people, I can promise you this. They're going to betray you and they're going to hurt you deeply. They will not be there for you when you need them. I can guarantee it. I can guarantee it. It's exactly what happened to Jerusalem on a larger scale. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. Now she's scattered abroad. She doesn't have a home. But finding no resting place, her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to festival. So you see the personification that the roads are now weeping. Because Jerusalem is destroyed. There's no temple. There are no people in the land. Nobody's coming to worship in Jerusalem anymore. You remember, you remember when COVID happened and we couldn't come to church? You remember how that played with our heads? Try 70 years of it. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her virgins have been afflicted. She herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the, all the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Uh, Jerusalem <clears throat> remembers in the day of her affliction and wondering all the precious things that were hers in the days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe, there was none to help her. Her foes gloated over her, and they mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy, and all who honored her despise her for they have seen her nakedness she herself groans and turns away her face just in shame and embarrassment her uncleanness was in her skirt she took listen to this she took no thought of her future she took no thought of her future therefore her fall is terrible she has no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. Verse 11, all her people groan as they search for bread. Is it nothing to all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me by the Lord, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Verse 18, for these things I weep, my eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me. Verse 17, Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. Isn't that a pitiful sight? A person overwhelmed with grief, stretching out her arms, looking for somebody to hug, and there's nobody around to console them. But the heart of it, because of our time here, I would encourage you to read all of Lamentation. It doesn't take very long. But the heart of it is said here in verse 9. She took no thought of her future. She lived her life as if it was never going to end. Jerusalem thought they were going to keep on sinning and keep on sinning and keep on sinning and keep on sinning and keep on sinning and, on sinning and get away with it. And they didn't believe God when he told them there's a reckoning coming. And 
can't you see ourselves in this? As we engage in sinful activity, we know good and well it is wrong. We may say the right things. We may say the right things loudly and try and justify it. And we may tell ourselves, I've got time to turn it around and I can stop it whenever I want to. Which, by the way, I can stop it whenever I want to is the clear indicator you have a very serious problem. I can stop it whenever I want to is the serious indicator that you have a legitimately serious problem. But ultimately, all of life, and what he's saying here, is it has to be viewed with understanding that life can change just like this. And I may never get my opportunity. I may never get my opportunity to do what I had planned on doing. There are people my age, younger, who are specimens and pictures of health. They don't wake up the next morning. Zero explanation as to why. We have to consider our actions in light of our future. That was Jerusalem's major downfall. They said, God hadn't punished us yet. It's going to be all right. And it was until it wasn't. So, we look at that, and then next week we'll pick up and uh, probably um, conclude the text. Uh, I've Got some thoughts that we may do to kind of summarize some things in Kings, but I'm not just certain on that. Uh, But we will look at how the book ends because surprisingly the way it ends is actually quite hopeful. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to kind of uh, discern some of that a little bit. But uh, that should be next week. So in the next two or three weeks, uh, depending, we'll turn our attention to, to Daniel.